Once again, good morning to all of you. It's uh, so good to have you here. And I just want you to, to just do the following with me. I want you to say the following words with me. Say, say this with me. Say believe. Say believe. Receive. Confess. And see. Believe. Receive. Confess. See. Okay, so what I just shared with you, whether you know that or not, is the process of receiving the promises of God. It's the process of receiving the promises of God. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And the title of my message this morning is Thankfulness from Faith, sorry, from Famine to Faith. From thankfulness, from famine to faith. Okay, and that is what I believe that God wants to do for us in this season that we are in. So how many of you would agree with me that there's famine in the world today? Okay, we're going to talk about that today. So first of all, let me just give you a scripture. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. It says the following. It says, in everything, everybody say in everything. Give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything. You see, I don't know if you know this, but the Greek word for thank is actually the same Greek word is chorus. Okay? Chorus. And chorus is the same word that is used for grace. It's the same word in the Bible that is used for grace. So, to, if you are full of grace... You are full of thanksgiving. If you are full of grace, you are full of thanksgiving. And God wants you to give thanks always. He wants you to give thanks always. Even when things don't go well with you. Okay, listen to this. God doesn't expect you to give thanks for the circumstances. He expects you to give thanks in the circumstances. Okay, and there's a big difference. God doesn't want you to give thanks for the circumstances, but He wants you to give thanks in the circumstances. You see, we choose that spirit of thanksgiving because we believe that God is faithful. How many of you believe that God is faithful? How many of you have seen that God is faithful? See, God is faithful. And He is able to work out all things for our good. Doesn't matter what happens to you, God will work it out for your good if you are thankful. You see, once again, our tendency is to see that in the ten good things that is happening to us, we see the one negative thing and then we focus on it and we fixate on it. We fixate on it. And we tend to look at what we don't have instead of thanking God for what we do have. You see, we need to understand that when we thank God for what we have, even the five loaves and the few fish that we have, the small that we have, will be multiplied. So, once again, you remember when Jesus fed the 5,000 people? That's exactly what He did. He gave the Father thanks for the little that He had, and it started to multiply. So what we need to do is, is that we need to cultivate a spirit of thanksgiving. And this is the time that we are in. And this is what Pastor Michael has also been preaching about. Thankfulness regardless of circumstances. Thankfulness regardless of what is happening around us in the world. Thankfulness is your lifeline in this time, in this season that we are in. You see, instead of complaining about your aches and your pains in your body. You know, how easy is it to focus on that? Instead of complaining about the aches and pains in your body, why don't we start thanking God for the parts that actually do work? Instead of complaining about the little that you have in your bank account, thank God for something in your bank account. Okay? Once again, when we count our blessings every day, when we thank God for what we do have, then that begins to multiply. And our focus starts to change. You see, that's very important, that our focus needs to change. Not on what we don't have, but on what we do have. And in Christ, we actually have everything. You see, so 
Not only will that give you more joy. I don't know if you've noticed that. When you focus on the good things in your life, all of a sudden you start getting more joyful. Your joy starts to increase. Okay, when you focus on what you don't have, how has that been working for you? Does it make you feel better or does it make you feel worse? Okay, it makes you feel worse. But when we focus on what the good that God has for us, then it starts to multiply. So, multiplication will come. And what I'm saying to you with that is that it is very important that we believe right. It is very important that we believe right with regards to God and His Word. You see, the problem we have a lot of times is, is wrong believing. And when we believe wrong, the problem is we behave wrong. When we believe wrong, we behave wrong. But when we change our beliefs, then our habits and our actions and all those things starts to change. So it's all about believing. And that actually what I'm talking to you about is the power of the gospel. It's the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Romans 1 verse 16, Paul said, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now sometimes when people hear that, the only thing that they think is, praise God, I'm going to heaven. But, and that's good. Okay, it's good to go to heaven. It's the way you want to go. It's where you want to be. But salvation, the Bible says salvation, the Greek word is soteria. It's soteria. And soteria means wholeness. So the gospel is the power of God unto your wholeness. It is the power of God unto your wholeness. And this gospel is the gospel for the world. This gospel is not limited to a certain individual. It's not limited to a certain church. It is the gospel is for all who believe. It is for all who believe. You see, what God does for someone else, He wants to do for you. What God does for someone else, He wants to do for me. Because it is the gospel. The gospel is for every single person who believes. So the key is to believe. And listen to this. I know it may not seem like it in the day and age that we are living. But God is a good God. God is a good God. And listen to this. He loves you so much that He sent His Son for the sole purpose of dying for your sins. He sent His Son for the sole purpose of dying for your sins. And I want you to remember this, that God loves His Son. God loves His Son. I don't think we know how much God the Father loves His Son. God loved His Son so much that He opened up the heavens above the Jordan River when He was baptized. God opened up the heavens above Him and He said these words. He said, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. That is how much God loves this Son. And listen, even though God loved this Son so much, He gave up His Son for you. He gave up His Son for me. And the gospel is all about how God loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for our sins. You see, Jesus is the only perfect sacrifice who can take our place on the cross. He's the only perfect sacrifice. No one else could do it. No angel could do it. No person, even though they may love you, there's no good enough person that could have done it except Jesus Christ. And God sent Him to die for us on the cross. And when you accept Him and His finished work on the cross, the Bible says you become born again. You become born again. And when you become born again, you become a new creation. You become a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, when you become born again, God starts to change you from the inside out. You become a new creation. Now, listen to this, and I think you all know this, that you still sometimes experience a desire to sin. 
Okay, don't look at me all holy. Okay, we still experience sometimes a desire to sin. But even though you experience that desire to sin, God no longer sees you in sin, but he sees you as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So say that with me. Say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You see, it's not about focusing on us. It's not about focusing on everything we do. It's focusing on what Jesus did. Okay, you see, our faith in Jesus' finished work is what pleases God. Our faith in Jesus' finished work on the cross is what pleases God. When you receive what Jesus did for you, it starts to change everything. When you receive it, okay? Can you see what I was talking about? Believe, receive, confess, see, okay? When you start to believe it, then, and you receive it, and you start to confess it, then you start to see it. You see, we can try to be good all we want to. We can try to change our behavior all we want to. But when we believe that we are the righteousness of God, when we receive that we are the righteousness of God, and we start confessing we are the righteousness of God, then we start seeing the fruit of the righteousness of God. You see, it all starts with what you believe. And listen to what the Bible says about Abraham. Romans 4 verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. You see, Abraham was made right before God by believing. So the question is, do you believe? You see, faith is very important in the body of Christ. We don't always understand what faith is. You know, there's so many, you know, people tell us, keep the faith. Keep the faith. And then a lot of us don't even know what faith is. Okay? So, why is faith so important? It is important because it is the way that we receive from God. It is the way that we receive from God. It is the only way that we receive from God. Is by faith. You see, and that's why it's important that we know the promises in the Bible. Okay, did you know that there are many promises in the Bible that are there for you? God has promises for you. For every situation in your life that you are going through, there are promises in the Bible for you. Every challenge that you are facing, there are promises in the Bible for you. For every difficulty, relationship difficulty, financial difficulty, um, physical difficulty, whatever there is, there's promises in the Word of God for you. And the thing is, is that we have to actively possess those promises. You have to actively possess them. You see, and this is the thing, if you do not know the promises of God, how can you claim them? The Bible says, my people perish due to a lack of knowledge. You see, what you don't know is hurting you. What you don't know, if you don't know the promises of God, you cannot claim them and you cannot receive them. And that's why we preach in the church. When we preach, we preach the word. Because when we preach the word, you hear the word, and then you can receive the promise of God. And that's why it's important to come to church so that you can hear the word, so that you can receive the word, so that you can activate the promises of God in your life. And I want to just give you an example of this. 1 John 4, 17 says the following. It says, as Jesus is... So are we in this world. What an amazing promise. As Jesus is, so are we in this world. Now I want you to notice what that verse says. It says, present tense. Present tense. It says, as Jesus is. Not as Jesus was. Wouldn't that be great? Even as Jesus was. When Jesus was on the earth, He was walking on the earth. He was doing miracles. He was raising the dead he was healing the sick so even as jesus was would be good but that's not what that scripture says it says as jesus is so are we okay and listen to this not somewhere out there 
Okay? Not somewhere in heaven. One day when we get to heaven, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. This world. This present world. You are right now as Jesus is. So, this means that as Jesus is now seated at the Father's right hand, we are also seated at the Father's right hand. Did you hear that? As Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand, so are we seated at the Father's right hand. Okay, now you might think that sounds strange, but doesn't the Bible say you are in Christ? You are in Christ. Because you are in Christ, you are in Christ. Where is Christ? Seated at the Father's right hand. You are seated with Him. So, I want to ask you today, what is your need in this season of your life? What is your need in this season of your life? We all go through different seasons, and this is the thing, seasons change, don't they? Seasons come, seasons go. As, as, as much as you will have a good season, there's going to come a difficult season. Okay? It's not always summer, is it? Sometimes winter comes. Okay? But doesn't matter what season of life you are in, we always have to look to our position in Christ. We always have to look to where we are in Christ. We are seated with Jesus in heavenly places. So, if you need healing, for instance, in your body, you have to ask yourself the question, is, if there's sickness in your body, say, does Jesus right now at the Father's right hand, does He have sickness in His body? No, He doesn't. Okay, He is perfectly healed. So as Jesus is, so am I in this world. Does Jesus have depression? No. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. You see, the moment that you believe that, the moment that you receive that, the moment that you start confessing that, then you will start to see that. The depression will start to lift. The sickness will go. Because you believe what Jesus did for you on the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember our scripture, they said that Abraham believed God and God accounted it to him. The moment you believe God, it is accounted unto you. Okay, you know what accounted means. It's like if you have a bank account. Okay, it is credited to your account. It is credited to you. And in Christ, all these things have been credited to you. Healing has been credited to you through Christ. All these things have been given to you. You see, there was a testimony that I heard about a lady who had a, a tumor in her breast. And she went for the scan. And after she went for the scan, they actually found the tumor in her breast. And they took a scan and they took the scan. She took the scan to church. And when she took the scan to church and she heard this, as Jesus is, so am I in this world, she wrote over that, Jesus does not have breast cancer. And as he is, so am I in this world. She went back to the doctor and the tumor was gone. You see, we believe, we receive, we confess, and then we see. You see, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. You see, we are not supposed to live in the world's way of seeing before we believe. That's how the world lives. The world says, I won't believe it until I first see it. Okay, but you know what? That's a false premise to even start from. Because let me ask you a, 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 a silly question. How many of you believe you have a brain? How many? Okay, how many of you have seen your brain? Okay, so if you only believe what you see, okay, it, is, it is, doesn't make sense, does it? You see, we can't only believe what we see. We, we believe a lot of things without seeing it. And that's the same with faith. Faith is not, we don't live according to the world's ways, we live according to God's ways. God's way is to believe it first, and then you see it. Not to see it first and then believe it. Okay, that doesn't require faith, by the way. Okay, to, to first see it and then believe it. You see, the visible manifestations of God's blessings in your life will start with faith. 
going to repeat that. The visible manifestations of God's blessing in your life will start with faith. If you want to see the visible manifestations of God's blessings in your life, it's going to start with faith. You see, even this building, years ago there was not a building. Then the church decided we are going to build a building. Okay, Even though there was nothing, it started by faith. And then today you can sit in this building because someone believed for this building to be built. And this building today is built so that the church can gather. It wasn't here. It wasn't painted. We didn't have carpets. We didn't have chairs. None of these things were here, but we believed God. And because we believed God, we saw the manifestation of what we believed. Yes, there was the process of time, but it manifested because of faith. Okay, it manifested because of faith. And just by the way, the gathering of the church is God's idea. Okay, coming to church is not man's idea, it's God's idea. Listen to what the Bible says, Hebrews 10 verse 25. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. You see, don't forsake the gathering of God's people. That's what the Bible says. It says, don't forsake the gathering of God's people. The Bible actually says we are to encourage one another to come. So that's a twofold encouragement. Encourage one another to come, but also when you come, you are encouraged. When you come, you are encouraged. That's part of why we come to, to church. And it says there, even so much more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? The return of Jesus Christ. So how many of you believe that Jesus Christ's return is soon? He's coming back soon. But even though he's coming back soon, the Bible says, do not forsake the gathering of the saints. Come together. You see, why should we do that? Because listen to what Peter 5, 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says. It says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Okay? So the Bible describes the devil as a roaring lion. Okay? He's only a roaring lion. Okay? He doesn't have... Jesus pulled his teeth. He doesn't have teeth anymore. Okay? But he's a roaring lion. He makes a lot of noise. But the problem is people listen to the noise. People listen to everything that he does and he brings fear into your life. Fear is the opposite of faith. So because you believe the fear, you see the manifestation of the fear. Okay, but the point is that the devil is walking around seeking those he can devour. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these um, National Geographic specials on lions. Okay, I don't know if you've seen how lions hunt, but lions... Don't just run after a prey, okay? What they actually do is that they go very slow. They go very slow. They're actually very patient when they are hunting. You see, what they do is that they mark someone or a, something that is weak. They follow the herd, the herd of whatever they are hunting, and they don't attack, listen to this, when the herd is strong. When the herd are together, when the herd is in unity, then they don't attack. Okay, what they do is that they, they look for something that is weak, something that is confused. When the herd starts to get confused and they leave behind the straggler, then they attack the straggler, the one that is isolated, the one that is left behind. Then they attack the one that is left behind. And listen to this, the Holy Spirit used this illustration because this is exactly what the devil does. He waits until you are out of fellowship. He waits until you are isolated. He waits until you are alone. And like a roaring lion, he seeks who he can devour. He seeks for someone who he can devour, someone that is all by himself. Okay, when, because this is the thing, when we are together, we are supernaturally protected. 
There's something about the church that you just cannot explain. There's a supernatural protection for those who are in the church. It's a supernatural protection. It's a divine protection. We cannot explain it. It's just the way that it is. Because it's God's idea. Now, every time in the Bible, you can go look throughout the Bible. You, whenever someone was alone, it didn't go well for them. Okay? Have you noticed the demoniac of, of Gadara? What does the Bible say about him? The Bible says that he was alone. He was alone. The demoniac of Gadara was alone. He was the most possessed man that ever lived. And he was alone. You see, that's what the devil wants to know. No, there are forces beyond the physical that we don't always understand. We can't just, like I said, we can't just live about what we see in the natural. There are forces that when people are alone, they start to think crazy thoughts. Isn't it? Have you noticed that? That is when depression runs rampant. When people are alone. When they are isolated. You see... When we are together, something just happens. We can't explain it. You come to church and all of a sudden the depression just lifts. You can't explain it. It's supernatural. Someone might say something or even though someone might not even say something, in the presence of God, whatever is trying to keep you bound is just removed. And that's why church is so important. Okay, the Bible actually says, where God's people gather together in unity, there... He commands the blessing. It is here where God commands the blessing. God commands the blessing. Okay, there's a blessing when we come to church. When believers gather together, there is safety. So, in saying that, I want to talk about something this morning a bit uh, that's perhaps controversial. Okay, now, when I say controversial, it's because everyone always talks against it. Okay, and I want to talk to you this morning about prosperity. Okay, everybody say it, okay, because it's not a dirty word. Say prosperity. Okay, prosperity. Okay, so God's heart for you is to enjoy prosperity. But listen to this, prosperity with a purpose. God's heart is for you to enjoy prosperity, but prosperity with a purpose. Now, don't mis misunderstand me. I know that there are many false teachings on prosperity. There are many people that over glorify wealth. Okay, for them it's all about the money. Show me the money. Okay, it's all about the wealth that is in the world. But the problem with that mentality is that it has caused many believers to think wrongly about God's provision. Many believers have believed wrong about God's provision. You see, while these teachings about God's provision are wrong, it doesn't mean that there is not a place for us to receive God's practical provision into our lives. Listen, God wants to provide for you. God wants to provide for you. But God, listen to this, is not into materialism. God is not into materialism. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 12, verse 15. And he said to him, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Take heed and beware of covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. One's life does not consist in the abundance of the things that he possesses. Beware of covetousness. You see, God is for prosperity with a purpose. God is for prosperity with a purpose. We, we, uh, where we are, we are blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. That's what God wants to do. He wants you to be blessed so that you can be a blessing to others. Listen, people don't understand this, but have you ever thought that if everyone was sick, if everyone was poor, if everyone was broke, if everyone was down, busted and disgusted, how will the gospel ever get out there? Sick people don't tell other people about God because they're flat on their back. They can't go and talk to other people about God. People who don't have money, the gospel 
needs money to go into the world. Okay, this church needs money to keep the lights on. This church needs money to buy seats. This church perhaps needs money to buy an aircon. Okay, but all the, everything that we need needs it, it costs money. Okay, for the gospel to go out to people so that people can hear the gospel costs money. But God is not into money having us, but He wants us to have money. And there's a big difference. So, you see, because of this teaching, people think that I just want to be holy and I don't want to have money because money will corrupt me. Okay, but that's not what the Bible says. God said to Abraham, He said to him, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Okay, God wants you to be a blessing. Genesis 12, verse 2 to 3. Genesis 12, verse 2 to 3. And even Joseph, the Bible says, Genesis 39, verse 3, it says, And his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Okay? Prosperity is in the Bible. Prosperity is part of what the Bible speaks. So, our blessing, God wants to bless us so that we can be a blessing. But the promise is that we cannot receive what we don't believe. You cannot receive what you speak against. You see, we, sometimes people think, does it really matter what I believe with regards to prosperity? Yes, it does. Because if you speak the wrong thing, if you speak against this, if you, if you don't receive it, you cannot have it. It cannot manifest in your life. And I believe that we are currently in, in the world, we are in a recession. We are in a, in a famine. Okay, and things I believe, listen to this, if, according to the world, things are not going to get better. Okay, I don't want to, to discourage you, but things in the world is not going to get better. The world is not getting better. I don't know how many of you have been here for a few years, but you've probably seen it's not getting better, it's getting worse. Okay, but as things get worse in the world, the Bible says in Isaiah 60, it says, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. Even though darkness covers the earth, God's glory will come upon those who believe. So for children of God, even though there's darkness in the world, light will come to us. So what I, <laughs> excuse me. So what I want to talk to you about this morning is to follow God's way in seasons of famine. So like I said, do you agree with me that there's famine in the world? Okay, things are getting worse. And we are heading for tough days. Okay, no, I don't know. Maybe you didn't come here this morning to hear that. But God always has a way out of famine. God always has a way out of famine. And the events that happen in the Bible, in the Old, in the Old Testament, is actually, it's types for us today. So we can see a story in the Old Testament that is actually speaking prophetically to us today. And one of those stories that I want to share with you today is the story of Isaac. Okay, and listen to this, Genesis 26 verse 1, it says, There was a famine in the land, besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. So we see that Isaac comes into a place and there is famine. Okay, now the famine in Isaac's time was very severe. It was severe. And it was a time when people didn't have enough to eat even because the crops couldn't grow. The famine in Isaac's time is actually important for us to study because Isaac is actually a picture of us. Did you know that? Isaac in the Bible is actually a picture of us. Listen to what the Bible says. If you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seeds and heir according to the promise. If you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Who was Abraham's seed? The Bible calls those of us who belong to Christ, we are Abraham's seed. And the clearest picture of Abraham's seed that we can see in the Bible is actually is his direct descendant, Isaac. 
Okay, and when we study how Isaac dealt with famine, we can actually find wisdom to unlock God's promises of provision even in times of famine. Okay, the Bible always gives us wisdom. Genesis 26 verse 1 to 3, I'm going to just read it all again. It says, there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said to him, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you for you and your descendants. Okay, so the first thing that we see there, what did God say to Isaac? Do not go down to Egypt. Do not go down to Egypt. So what does that mean? It means for us today that we should not give up on God's ways or to follow God's ways when famine happens. Isn't that exactly what happens? You know, the world can offer you a lot of solutions, underhanded deals, underhanded means of gaining wealth quickly, get-rich-quick schemes, okay? But God's way for increase is through labor. Okay, listen to this. God wants you to work. God's way for increase is through labor. Proverbs 13 verse 11 says, Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. Did you hear that? And let that be something for many people who gained wealth through dishonesty in the world today. They think they are getting away with it. Listen to what the Bible says. Wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished. But he who gathers by labor will increase. Okay? So you might feel that I'm working and nothing is working, but if you work by labor, you will increase. You see, as God's children... We can do things with honor. We can do things with dignity because we can trust that our reward will come from God. Our reward will come from God. And it's more than just finances. Listen to this. When I'm talking about prosperity, I'm not just talking about finances. Finances is not the only blessing that prosperity offers. You see, God wants to bless you in every area of your life. According to the blessings of Abraham, Deuteronomy 28, when you remain in God's ways, you will lend to many nations and you shall not borrow. You shall be the head and not the tail. You shall be above and not beneath. You see, prosperity is not only financial, but it includes health. It includes wholeness. It includes complete well-being. Complete well-being. How many of you would like to have complete well-being? You see, that is something that money cannot buy. And that is the prosperity that God talks about. So, how do you know whether you are following God's ways or whether you are following the world's ways? See, it's very simple. The principle is simple. Are you losing health and sleep over what you are doing? Is what you are doing making you very stressed? Okay, it seems to you you are toiling, you are working hard. Are you overwhelmed by constantly monitoring the markets? You know, is the, is the rent going up? Is the rent going down? Okay, how many people have heart palpitations when they see the rent going up and down? Okay, you see it's because of the stress in the world. It's because they are focused on the wrong thing. You see, if you feel your life is filled with pain in what you are doing that's not god's way of blessing because the bible says god's way of blessing does not come with sorrow proverbs 10 22 and 23 says the blessing of the lord makes one rich and he adds no sorrow with it no sorrow with it the word sorrow actually here means painful toil painful toil and it doesn't mean that you don't work hard okay it's like someone exercising in the gym okay i don't know if you've ever exercised in the gym but if you take some if you do some exercises you do still sweat okay you're supposed to i don't know if you don't go to you go to the gym and you don't sweat then maybe you're not working as hard as you should but if you're exercising you sweat but after you sweat you feel good okay you worked hard but you felt good 
You see, that is the same thing. When God's way of prosperity is not filled with pain, okay, it includes work, but it is not filled with pain. It is not filled with sorrow, but it is with peace and abundance. So if we want to follow God's way, we need to follow that way. That is His way to prosperity. So, you know, many people say prosperity is just something you feel peace in your heart and you just feel joy. And while all those things are good and necessary, which prosperity also produces, okay, it's not the only thing that prosperity produces. You know, in the Bible, there's this, this word called shalom. How many of you have heard this word shalom? It's a Hebrew word. And it actually means in the Greek, the Greek word for, for, for blessing is irene. Okay, so those are the words for, for blessing. And if you look at what they actually mean, they mean prosperity. They mean well-being. They mean health. They mean completeness. They mean safety. So it's more than just peace of mind. It's more than just, you know, having this peace of mind. Just going through the storms of life and saying, you know, it's probably God's will for me to, to go through all of this and to suffer and to continue to suffer. Okay? God doesn't want you to suffer. He doesn't want you to toil. Okay? Even in the darkest of circumstances, He wants to take you through. You see, God redeemed us from the curse of the law. Okay? So, once again, God is not in covetousness. God is not into greed. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. For which some have strayed from the faith into greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, the love, people say money is the root of all evil. That's wrong. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples, Mark 10, 23. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for those to have riches to enter into the kingdom of God? Okay, isn't that, the disciples were shocked at that statement. But Jesus actually clarified what he was saying in the next verse. He said, and the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God? You see, the money, the problem is not the money. The problem is, is your trust in the money. Or is your trust in God? You see, those who trust riches are not just those with money. Sometimes people who have little money put all their faith in their money. If I don't have a lot of money, then I'm depressed. If I have money, then I'm happy. You see, if money is determining what you, the way you live, then your mindset needs to change. You see, God wants all these blessings to come upon us and overtake us. Okay, so did you see when blessings is overtaking you, you are not chasing the blessings. You are pursuing God and as you are pursuing God, the blessings overtake you. You don't chase after the blessings, you chase God. As you chase God, the blessings overtake you. You see, God is not against money. It's actually Him who created it. Genesis 2 verse 10 to 12, we see, Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. The name of the first is Pishon, and the one who scourged the whole land of Avila, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. God said the gold of the land is good. Okay, God doesn't have a problem with money, but He does have a problem with people loving money. Okay, covetousness. So, what I want to say to you this morning is that God wants to bless you. God wants to make a, a prosperity abound toward you. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 to 8 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Doesn't that sound like prosperity? All sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. 
Blessed to be a blessing. Blessed to be a blessing. Abundance for every good work. You see, God wants you to be a cheerful giver. And that's exactly, even in seasons of famine, He didn't stop using God's ways. He didn't stop practicing God's ways. Listen to Genesis 26 verse 12 to 14. Then Isaac sowed in that land. Now I just want to show you quickly a picture of that land. I don't know, I don't think we know what that land that Isaac sowed into looked like. Okay, now you can't see it very nicely there. Okay, it's actually, it was a desert land. There were so many cracks in the earth that you couldn't even see the soil. You couldn't see the soil. It was, it was a dry land. It was a parched land. There was nothing. There's no natural way that you could have sown in this land. But Isaac sowed in this land and he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. In the same year he reaped a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. The man, and listen to what happened. Even though he sowed in this land of famine, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. For he had possessions of flocks, possessions of herds, and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. He sowed in famine, and he was blessed so much that the people of the land started envying him. In famine. You see, when we sow where God leads us, He will surely bless us. He will. Now listen, you may not see results immediately. No, but if you sow a seed into the ground, does it grow immediately? No, it takes time. And it doesn't always make sense to you. But initially, if you do it by faith, Isaac sowed in the land, and even though there was famine in the land, even though it was terrible, the Lord blessed him with a hundred fold return a hundredfold harvest and he continued blessing him until he became very prosperous so that is what God wants us to do even in famine don't stop sowing don't stop paying your tithe don't stop giving to God your tithe you see those are the things that is going to keep us sustained even in this time You see, logically speaking, it doesn't make sense. It's perhaps one of the worst things that to sow in famine land. But Isaac still did it by faith. He still did it by faith. So in everything you do, sow in, into what God tells you to sow into. And He will provide for you. Honor and worship God in your finances through tithing. And wealth and material possessions isn't the only blessing that you're going to receive. You are going to receive wholeness. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing lacking. Let's pray. Father God, I want to come today, Lord, and Lord, even though we are living in a world, Lord, where there is famine all around us, Lord Father, thank you that you are not limited to this world's way of doing things. Father, you are not limited to the natural circumstances. Father, your word says, Lord, that Isaac sowed in famine, and Lord, you blessed him a hundredfold. Lord, many of us, Lord God, when famine hits, when difficult times come, Lord, we, we stop doing things your way. We stop practicing your ways, Father God. But Lord, I know that this morning you have spoken to me about this, and Lord, I also know that you have spoken to people in this place about this. Lord, that, that even though there's famine in the land, Lord, we are not going to look to the world and the world's way of doing things. Father, thank you that you can bless us regardless of what is happening in the world. Father, help us to focus on your way of doing things and being right. And Lord, as we do that, we will see the increase. We will see the blessing. We will see the manifestation of what you do in our lives. And Father, this is my prayer for every single person in this church today. Father, I'm not here to, to, to try to convince them, to manipulate them, to try to get them to do something that they don't want to do. Lord, your word says you love a cheerful giver. 
Lord, if they're not giving cheerfully, Lord, let them rather not give at all. But Lord, as they give out of the, out of the love in their heart, as they sow, Lord God, as they give their tithes, their offerings, Father, thank you, Lord God, that you will increase and multiply them, even in famine, and you will bring a hundredfold into their lives, Lord God, a hundredfold. And Lord, they will be blessed so much that even the world will envy them because of the prosperity the wholeness, the nothing missing, the nothing broken, the nothing lacking that you will bring into their lives. And I pray that in the almighty name of Jesus and we give you the praise, the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Share something with you guys this morning and it's maybe, you know, just to back up the word. Um, in our cell group, um, I want to share a testimony. We've got cell every Wednesday um, consistently, you know. At our place, um, some of our cell members are here this morning. But we started about a month, two months ago, really, you know, trusting the Lord. Um, we had a prayer book, coming back to some of the basics, you know, um, doing, doing the stuff that God wants us to do consistently. So in our cell meeting, we started a prayer book, and um, Leta is actually handling it for us, and we started making specific notes and prayer requests to the Lord in our cell group. Um, some of the guys that's not here this morning, and I want to share their testimony because they really trusted the Lord for money um, to, to be able to visit their parents. So they all stay in Vereniging, um, and their parents stays in Bloemfontein and in Olival Noord. So we started praying and really trusting the Lord together with them. And... You know, we don't have the money that they've asked the Lord for, you know, to enable them. They've got an old car, cars roadworthy, you know, but not always trustworthy. But, um, and they trusted the Lord, and a week before they had to leave, and they, you know, we, we said we, they made a decision, they're going to go away this weekend. And they, um, a week before, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the total amount of money. And the husband, or, or, or Quibus, you know, on the day before they had to leave, they had this discussion, Dude, are we going to go because we don't have the money? And they made a decision to trust the Lord still. In that, you know, they will put the money that they have, they will put fuel in their car, and they will drive to Bloemfontein because they haven't seen their parents for four years. And, um, you know, and they took a step of faith. They actually went all the way to Bloemfontein, stayed there, went to Olival Noord, and the Lord just blessed them. They didn't take out a cent. Their fuel was covered from, from when they got there, food, everything was covered for them, you know, to make their trip uh, possible. And I wanted to share that with you guys, because a testimony should build us up, should build our faith, you know. It's not just wishful thinking or... You know, it's, it's, it's this pie in the sky thing. When we really trusted God, when we really prayed together as a cell group, the Lord is just moving. That's one example, you know, in our cell that has happened in the last couple of, of months, that God is really moving and, and coming through for people miraculously. I mean, municipality bulls being slashed 50%. And um, I wanted to share that because it, I, I wanted us to, to know that God is still working. He is working. And my prayer, and as I was sitting here, was just, you know, if you're not part of a small cell group, you know, it's like coming to church. It's, it's just a family. It's an extension of the church. Every Wednesday, we build each other up. You know, there's that, that person that's actually there to pray with you, available. So if you're not part of a cell group, I'm going to maybe stay behind. If you want to get part of a cell group and, you know, be brave to maybe lead a small group, you know, come and see me after this service tonight, uh, this morning. Come and see me. Even the guys that's, that's say, saying, listen, I would like to take on a small group, you know, being active and, and partake in what the Lord is busy doing. Come and see me. But I want to really encourage you guys also get, get part of a small group. And if you're not in one, you know, let's come and see me afterwards so that we can really connect people that can pray with you and to, to stand in faith with you. And um, I want to just give God the glory for that because he's really moving. And, and I wanted to share that, Pastor. Thank you.
Amen. Let's keep God praying. Amen. I think it's confirmation. When you trust God, provision will come. Have a blessed week.